So we just left looking at um, how Western society, the Oscar Wilde case, shaped homosexuality. And now I want to explore a different uh, place around the same time, uh, still, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, focusing on Mexico. Mexico um, kind of has its own interpretation of homosexuality that differs from other parts of the world. And, and this is why we, when we talk about sexuality, particularly as an identity, we talk about it uh, in a way that's being shaped rather than than some form of absolute. Um, so when we talk about concepts of sexuality, particularly sexual identity, we have to understand that they're very complicated as probably your generation knows, right? So that's why it's so hard to say one or the other, right? That, you know, something like the Bible condemns homosexuality because these are terms that are being shaped by, by time. So in Mexico, you have this very famous event called um, Los Cuarenta y Uno. So if you're Mexican-American, um, you might know this, or, or maybe you want to um, ask your, maybe your parents, but maybe your grandparents, they might know this better. Um, but in Mexican culture, it is um, noted that when Mexican men turn 41, there's a possibility of them becoming gay. And um, this is why many Mexican men never say that they're 41. They say that they're 40 or 42. So they kind of skip a year. Um, I myself am 43. I, I did turn 41 a few years back. And, and it was funny when I was teaching this in one of my classes, because that class um, asked me, they're like, did it happen? And I, and I completely forgot because I had given this lecture a while back. And I asked them, what happened? And they're like, did it? <laughs> did he turn gay? And I was like, oh, no, no, you know, it's just, um, you know, it, it was just kind of more funny than anything uh, because it's the number that's associated. And we have to understand when you turn 40, when you get into your 40s, you go through a, you know, midlife crisis. So this is why this number gets associated with this idea. Now, the actual number has nothing to do with age, but has to do with this event. So just to give you the, the history behind this event <clears throat> is that on, on November 17, 1901, 41 men were arrested uh, for engaging in, in an act that people were not happy with. So it wasn't really a crime because there was no law against it, but definitely the um, city wasn't happy with what was happening. So what happened was that 41 men, half of them dressed as women, half of them dressed as men, were at a dance hall. Now these, these men were not you know, lower class men, they were middle class men, and they were actually con you know, associated with the upper crust of Mexican society. So it became a very significant event. So uh, as, it, as I have noted here, that prior to this incident in Mexico, there is no concept of homosexuality. These were just men that were behaving in a very odd way that made the rest of society very uncomfortable, at least from their, perspe their perspective. So these are some pictures, and, and I hope you take a quick second to look at them, uh, because it became a major um, discussion point in Mexico. You know, here you have a song that was actually created. This this is part of the research that I did back when I was a, a, a graduate student in, in college. Uh, so, and, and most of the, you know, this event actually gets lost in time. Most people don't know about it. That's why I, I gave you that introduction with the number 41 being associated with age. Um, and uh, again, these balls were very typical of the era. Um, a lot of times they did it with prostitutes where they would auction off somebody um, because that's just, you know, what people did, you know, they auction off a virgin and, um, you know, they, they, they engage in this behavior and life would go on. The only difference here is that they got caught. As I noted earlier, right, most of them came from the upper crust of Mexican society. Now, this is significant because at this time you have uh, a very, um, unpopular president. His name was Porfirio Diaz that everybody hated. So the, particularly the lower class hated. This is part of the reason why I had the Mexican Revolution. <clears throat> so they associate this event with 
the, the dictatorship with Porfirio, Porfirio Diaz's uh, dictatorship in Mexico. So it just kind of adds fuel to the fire saying, you know, we already hate you. Now look at how, how your people are being, are behaving, right? So it, it didn't help, uh, you know, um, the presidency at that time, <clears throat> even though, he, you know, the president himself wasn't involved. So what happened in this event? Well, they arrested them, but they really couldn't charge them with anything. As I said earlier, there is no no law against this behavior. So all they could do is, you know, uh, try to have these men regain their manhood. So what they did is that they grabbed a, a group of men that were arrested during this raid, and they um, sent them sent them out to the Yucatan. Uh, again, here you see some of the political cartoons from the era. And, and the, the theory behind this was that if you send them down to a war zone, um, you know, they can go and be in the military and kill some people and regain the sense of manhood, right? Uh, again, this is during the, the Porfiriato predating the revolution. So it's putting down some of these uprisings that are happening against the Mexican government at this time. So you see how this event kind of ties into the politics of Mexico during this era. Um, so yeah, uh, a good number of them were sent down to uh, the Yucatan to put down an uprising. Um, another group, I think I have it here, just to go back. Oh, you see them right here. The other group were put in the, um, were given brooms and they had to wear the clothes that they were caught with and they had to clean the streets of Mexico. And you could see the crowd back there kind of laughing at them, right? And this was supposed to be a form of public shame so they can stop behaving in this, in this way. Now, as, as time went by, you know, this was all over the newspapers. Somebody actually, as I said earlier, they wrote a song about it. They, um, somebody wrote a book about it. And so it, it gained a lot of press, but it made Mexico, um, it put Mexico in a very negative light. Uh, so much so that um, Mexico actually blame other countries. This is, again, in the context of, of what's happening in Mexico in the Porfiriato, is that Porfirio Diaz invited uh, American corporations, uh, European companies to move into Mexico uh, to build the industry there and then kind of exploit the, the country for their own gain. So most of the food that was being produced in Mexico is being shipped back to these places because they're going through an industrial revolution and they needed to feed their, feed their population. So you can see how an event like this became very political where Mexicans themselves said, oh my God, we, we're not gay, right? We, we don't, we don't engage in this behavior. This is something that was brought over by those gringos, right? <laughs> by those effeminate British. And as we just said earlier, right? The, the British in the whole Oscar Wilde situation already kind of associated with, uh, femininity. So much of the blame is being put outside of Mexico saying, look, we don't do this. It's other people, you know, that bring it here. You know, we caught the gay from, you know, the, the Americans or, or from the Europeans. And, and, and it's, 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 it's a very important event because <clears throat> Mexico has to come to terms with, no, some Mexican men enjoy, you know, behaving this way, whether it's dressing this way or are engaging in, you know, what we call today homosexual behavior. Right. So it, it begins to question these concepts that we have of Mexicanness, particularly Mexican machismo, right? Particularly, you know, Mexican men need to be strong, authoritative, dominant males. And an event like this, where half of them were dressed as female, more in the passive role, it begins to question our, our sexuality, our masculinity, and even our Mexican identity, right? Because again, this came from within, they didn't come from outside, even though they put the, they tried to put the blame on the United States and, and the, the Europeans. At the end of the day, these were Mexican men who were engaging in this behavior. Now the event, uh, like I said, kind of disappears from the Mexican consciousness. The, the number remains, but the event itself is just kind of forgotten because, you know, many things happen. You know, the Mexican Revolution happens, and then, you know, many years go by. <clears throat> and we see in that particular event is that both parties were arrested, right? Not the, the one that were dressed as male were not let go. They had to go fight, right? So both parties were considered, if you will, gay in that particular incident. However, things changed with a very important writer. His name is Octavio Paz. Very, very important Mexican 
uh, social critic, uh, Mexican philosopher, if you will. And he, he kind of redefines that idea of homosexuality in Mexico. So whereas in American culture, we associate both male, um, whether you're effeminate or, or masculine, you're, you know, if you're engaged in this behavior, we consider it homosexual, right? Um, in Mexico, it's a little bit different, particularly, particularly because um, of what happens here. Octavio Paz writes a very famous essay called Los Hijos de la Chingada. Um, if you take my Chicano Studies class, we actually read this piece. Now, this, this article that he writes, um, Octavio Paz is trying to, to synthesize what does it mean to be Mexican. So he writes a collection of essays. This is just one of the many essays he has in there. But in this essay, he argues that in Mexican um, culture, you can only be two ways. You could be the chingon or you can be the chingada. So in Mexican culture, you're either fucking or you're being fucked, essentially, right? Uh, and he looks at the world in this way. He talks about the Mexican um uh, conquest, the conquest of the Aztecs in this, in, in this lens, where he says, um, you know, our mother, La Malinche, got sexually abused by, by, um, by our father, Cortes, right? So there you see the, the, um, that idea of the chingon and the chingada, right? So he argues that basically you want to be the chingon in Mexican culture, it is good to be the chingon, right? The machista. And obviously it's negative, for, particularly for men, to be the chingada. You know, to be the Virgin Mary who's, you know, take, she takes care of us, but she's passive. Or to be the malinche, which is even worse because she sold out, according to Paz. Um, she sold out Mexico. Uh, and the father, Cortez, he goes around doing chingaderas. He goes around screwing whoever he wants. He has kids. But he leaves them. And this is actually what happened in the conquest of Mexico. Uh, without, um, Cortez actually, um, has sex, you know, obviously has, um, sexual relations with La Malinche and, uh, actually takes the kid back to Spain with him. But, uh, he, he takes La Malinche and he offers her to some other guy. Uh, so she's not, right? She's not that important to him in his life. And he says, this is who Mexican men are. Now, why is this important to Mexican sexuality, but to the sexual identity? Well, Octavio Paz basically argues, as long as you're the chingon, you maintain your masculinity. Hopefully that kind of resonates, right, with us, that as long as, in Mexican culture at least, as long as you're the one doing the penetrating, you're not viewed as homosexual. And that's the way it's kind of looked at. In Mexico for you know for generations things are changing now because they're being influenced by American culture but through generations in Mexican culture you know you could be with a with a, with a woman you could be with a man as long as you maintain that machista identity the you know you're the penetrator you're not accused of being homosexual in Mexican culture so uh, it's a it's a bit of a twist of what happened in 1901 with Los 41, where both men were arrested, right? Half the ones that were dressed as women and the ones who were dressed as men in American, uh, sorry, in, in post 1950s Mexico, um, that changes where only the one that's feminine is associated with homosexuality. Now people have argued that Octavio Paz himself was gay. So this kind of coded him in a, in, a, in a way that negated his homosexuality. You know, as long as he's the one doing the penetrating or the one that, that embodies the concept of the machismo, then he cannot be accused of being homosexual. All right, we'll stop it there and we'll talk about the last idea of um, lesbian women and, and the concept of passionate friendships.